Amen. Thank you, youth choir. Aren't you glad to know you can call on the name of the Lord Jesus and he'll answer every time. Amen. Amen. Turn with me back to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. We started looking this morning at the life in the Spirit. Life in the Spirit. How many of you were in the 8 o'clock service this morning? All right, you're going to get a little repeat because I didn't make it as far in the 1050 service as I did in the 8 o'clock service. So you may hear some of this twice, but you probably needed it a second time anyway. Besides, you probably took a nap this afternoon. You forgot everything I said this morning. (laughs) I wasn't expecting you to admit to it. I would, lo- I would love to think that you memorize every word that falls off my lips, but um, I remember listening to preaching too. But you know what I do pray is that you not hear what I have to say. I pray that you hear what the Holy Spirit of God says to your heart anyway. Uh, matter of fact, that's what this series is really all about, is learning to depend upon the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if there's anything that God continues to teach me uh, with greater depth, is how worthless my works are in the flesh. How empty they are. How powerless they are. And that I have no ability to persuade. I have no ability to bring about change in a person's life. It is only the Holy Spirit of God using me, working through me, taking his word and applying it to your life that makes any difference. So I spend a lot of my time pleading with the Lord and asking God for a fresh filling of his Holy Spirit to do what I am incapable of. And that is what this this series is going to be about, life in the Spirit. We looked at this morning, is what I'm going to conclude tonight with, is walking in the Spirit. There are four things that we're going to examine over the next several services. If you were in the 8 o'clock service, I couldn't remember all four, but I got it now. I hope. Number, we're looking at walking in the Spirit today. He said, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of your flesh. And the next time we're going to look at the war. We're looking at the walk. Next time we're going to look at the war, because he said that the flesh lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. There's a war going on inside of you. If you come, if you know Jesus tonight, if you've been born again, there is a conflict of interest going on inside of you. The self-life, the old nature, the old man is at conflict with the new nature that God has placed inside of you. And they're going to war against each other. And then we're going to look at the works. Uh, The next time we're going to look at the works of the flesh. He said in verse 19, they're evident. The works of the flesh. Now notice two things, and I'm not going to get into the preaching of this yet, but I just want you to be be aware because it's coming. He said the works of the flesh are evident. But in verse 20, he said, but the fruit of the Spirit, you see the difference? The works, that's what I'm doing. The works of the flesh, that's what I'm producing. The old, old nature, the old self-life, the old person, the, it'll show you clearly what I'm producing. But it didn't say the works of the Spirit, did it? It said the fruit of the Spirit. It's a different concept because I, on my own, in the flesh, I cannot produce fruit. It is only the Spirit of God growing and working in, out, in me and working out of me the fruit of the Spirit. So those are the two things. And then finally, uh, at some point, we're going to look at the witness of the Spirit. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us not, how, how interesting to end this chapter, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So walking in the Spirit, understanding that when, when you were saved, when you were born again, matter of fact, John chapter 4 teaches us that when you were born again, he told Nicodemus, you must be born again, you must be born of the Spirit. A new nature comes to live inside of you. A new person the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of the Lord comes to dwell inside of you to produce what you are incapable of producing on your own. It's a fresh reminder to us tonight that 
as I have stated, and I will continue to state over and over, you are incapable of living the Christian life on your own. Somehow we have developed the concept in our Christian world that, that I was, and he says it clearly in Galatians, you started in the spirit and now you think you're going to finish in the flesh? You think you're going you're to start out now in the flesh? You were saved by the spirit. It's a reminder to us that, that on my own, in the flesh, I cannot live the Christian life. I can't love you like I'm supposed to love you in the flesh. I can't have the joy of the Lord in the flesh. I can't work that up. The patience, the gentleness, the kindness, all the things that we're going to look at that are fruits of the Spirit, I can't produce those on my own. But yet we do try. We spin our wheels, we work hard at producing good works, and, and we, we wear ourselves out trying to do things for God. When the fruit of the Spirit is a natural overflow of the life of Jesus in us. You know how many people I witness to? As many people as God tells me to. Ooh, got a little quiet on that. But it's the truth. It is the truth. Uh, it is the Holy Spirit's job to use me as he sees fit. What we spend more time doing is telling God, this is how I think it ought to be done. We say things like, Lord, I want you to rule and reign in my life. Well, then get out of the way. Stop trying to do it on your own and telling God how it ought to be and let the Spirit of God overflow in your life. Jesus said, I will put into you a spring of water that overflows. It overflows. Matter of fact, we're supposed to constantly be in flood stage. Springs up out of us. I can't produce that. I can't work that up. I can't manipulate that. That is something only the Spirit of God can do. And when he rises up in me and says, uh, it's what I've said to you before, I want to witness everywhere I go. I want my actions, my attitude, my spirit, my at the atmosphere surrounding me, I want it to witness to everybody I see. And I've given you that quote, but I'll say it again. St. Francis of Assisi used to say, Witness everywhere, and when necessary, use words. But people ought to see in your life, they ought to see in your attitude, in your reaction, in your actions. You see, that's part of what reacting is, it's the overflow. It's the overflow. When something happens and your reaction is, is bad, that's the overflow, that's what's in the heart, because it comes out of the heart. But if in the heart there is the overflow of the Holy Spirit, then what, the, what your reaction is going to be is the Spirit of God operating in you and through you. So he said there in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. I now, upon salvation, now have a controlling factor of God living in me. I'm just kind of rehashing some of the things that I, I shared with you this morning. I have a controlling factor. I don't need now the law hovering over me, beating me down, beating me uh, in guilt and shame of what I need to be doing. I now have a controlling factor in me. I don't, I don't need the law of God trying to control me. I have the Spirit of God living in me to control me. And we give him full control. That's part of what sanctification is. It is, it's why John 3.30, uh, Lord, I must decrease. You must increase. You must have more control. I must have less control. And there are times that what I have said to, has been, Lord, none of me and all of you. Now, I still feel that way, but I'm going to share with you here in just a moment that there's a reason why John did not say, none of me and all of you. There's a reason why he said, I must decrease and you must increase. The Spirit's control in our life. Walk in the Spirit. As I, I mentioned this saying to you this morning from John MacArthur, he said, the more a believer attempts to force himself to live by rules and regulations, no matter how lofty they may be, the more he stifles the work of the Holy Spirit. 
Something God has been trying to teach me for several weeks now. This, this message, this series is really coming from an overflow of a lesson God has been taking me through. Because I have had times over the last few weeks that my devotions have dr been dry. And I'm walking away going, Lord, did you have nothing to say today? <laughs> my prayers have seeming to be hitting the walls and bouncing around. And I, I'm going, Lord, where's the, where's the witness of the Spirit this morning? And what the Lord had, even through this weekend, God was teaching me about fellowship, about spending time with God just because of who he is. And what had happened is over, over time, I became consumed with making sure I had a sermon prep prepared, making sure I had my studying done and being so concerned with that that my devotion time was eat up with, well, I got to hurry up and find out what God wants to say to me next instead of just being with God and just worship and fellowship and giving him praise and glory, waiting before him in prayer and just saying, God, I'm just here. I'm just here for a little while. I'll ask you for stuff later, but right now, I'm just here. I just want to be with you. Have you ever never had someone in your life that you just... You didn't care if you ever talked or if you ever, you just, I'm that way with my wife. I like just being with her. We can travel for miles down the road and never say a word to each other, but it means a lot because she's just right there. Just quiet, being together in her presence. And the same thing is with God. If you go back and read people from 100 years ago, they talk a lot about waiting on the Lord, waiting before God. And I've been studying that principle because I'll be honest with you, uh, in this ADD world of which I have a lot of ADD tendencies, it's hard just to sit before God and do nothing and wait. You say, well, that's not like a waste of time. But the Bible talks about the meditation. Be still and know that I am God. He didn't say be still and ask God for a hundred things. You see, I am all about having especially in my prayer time, I'm all about having this list of things. I have a prayer list. I have a little journal that I keep my prayers and uh, my prayer requests before the Lord. And, and really my goal is zero to 20 prayer requests in, in under 30 minutes. Well, ain't that bad. But that, I mean, that's my, that's my thought process. All right, here's everything I want to ask God for. Let me get down here. I'm going to pray. I'm going to get it all done. And I feel good about myself when I say amen. I've covered the whole territory. Good. I have covered everything in prayer. I've, I've prayed about everything that I can think of regarding the church and, and decisions that we need to make, the direction we're heading, people and staff and, and all the things that I need to pray. I've prayed over it. Good. It's done. And I'm up. I can go. And I have totally abandoned be still and know that I am God and just relax in his presence, to be in his presence, to worship him and honor him and listen. Oh, I do a lot of talking, but there are times I just need to sit and listen to what the Lord has to say. So this, what I'm sharing with you, this walking in the Spirit are, are, are really just some overflow lessons that God has been trying to teach me. This afternoon, I was sharing with Sandra some of the things that God had been saying to me over the last couple of days uh, of just going back to just fellowship and letting the fellowship be the overflow of the ministry, that what I give to you, what I do every day, what I share with people who come to see me is the overflow of what God has been speaking into my life. And my wife so lovingly and gently said, you know, I told you that about two months ago. <laughs> you wouldn't let God speak to you through your wife, would you? <laughs> and I have to confess, she did say that very thing to me about two months ago. Uh, but it's a lesson I had to learn. Walking in the Spirit, life in the Spirit. That it's not about the outward expressions. You see, the outward expressions must come from the inward work. But what we have done in our society in modern day churches, we have built our churches on the outward works so that we look successful. 
And as long as we look successful, and, and I can say to you when people say, well, how's the church going? Oh, man, it's great. Uh, we're running such and such. We're giving this much and, and uh, had this many saved. I baptized this many this year. That's the outward appearance of success. And, and Jim Cimbala said this in one of his earlier books that I have read before. He said that, that if we have a church house full of people who don't go out and live for God, what have we done? When the whole purpose of us coming into the house of God is to grow in our relationship, to draw closer to him. My number one goal as the pastor of this church is to lead you in discipleship, to push you toward your, in your relationship with God, to go deeper, to know him more, to draw closer and closer to him. Walking in the spirit. It is the Holy Spirit's job to make us holy. Uh, Oswald Chambers is one of my favorite authors. I read him every, just about every morning, my utmost for his highest. And the one devotion that, that he, he has, because I read it every year, every day throughout the year. And there's one that every year when I come to it and I read it, and again, the Holy Spirit of God just stabs me. And the, the whole subject matter of the devotion is we spend a lot of time looking at our own whiteness, our own holiness, or our own purity. And we become obsessed with how holy we are. Do I have all the appearances of holy? Am I having all the disciplines that make me look holy? When it, it goes back to all I have to do is walk in the spirit. And if I walk in the spirit, I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's the Holy Spirit's job to make me holy. I cannot make myself holy. It is the Holy Spirit's job to work in and through me, to deal with issues in my life, to deal with the things that, that he wants to deal with. He knows, he, he is the great sculptor. He is the one chipping off the things in my life to make me more like Jesus. And he knows what needs to be knocked off. He knows when to knock it off. He knows how to knock it off. And I can't sit around worrying about, am I holy enough? My job is to make sure I am walking in the Spirit. That I have my life focused on knowing the Lord Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Holiness comes from the Holy Spirit. It is his job to perform that through us, to work through us. Matter of fact, we're right here at it. Turn over a couple of pages to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16. In verse 14, he says... Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 16, he says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. He said, I am praying that through the power of the Holy Spirit, the riches of his glory, that you would be strengthened in the inner man. Did he say that I need to strengthen myself? No, he said, I'm praying that the Spirit of God strengthen you on the inner man, uh, in the inner man. He said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Which goes back to what we're talking about, walking in the Spirit. And if we will walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Only pride or ignorance could lead a believer to live by an outward list of rules and commands in his own limited and sinful power when he can live by the perfect and fully sufficient inner power of the Holy Spirit. As I said this morning, it is a lot easier for us to have a set of rules that we can check off and say, I must be right with God because I've done everything on the list. It is much harder to get before the Lord and say, as David said, search me, O God. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. To say to God, open up the door of my heart. Look on the inside. What do you see? Because see, really, our list of I didn't do this and I didn't do that and I didn't go here and I didn't do this. That is about our looking. We're looking at ourselves saying, well, see, I must be holy. I, I, there's my list of things that I'm supposed to do and not do, and I did them all, and, and I must be holy. God must be so proud of me. <laughs> but David said, search me. 
Get, get honest before the Lord. Lord, you look and see. What, do, what are you looking at? What do you see? You see, I, I've always thought I was a pretty good husband. But there was one day I asked my wife. <laughs> and then I found out I had some things I need to work on. Several years ago, we went through a time of just really dealing with some things that we had put off for a long time. Facing the truth. And I had been thinking for so long because my wife had been telling me how perfect I was. She had to repent for lying later. But see, it's easy to look at ourselves and we're judging ourselves by ourselves. The measure we're using is us. And even better yet, we'll judge ourselves in comparison to somebody else. And very rarely are we going to look at somebody else and say, well, they're, they're better than I am. Most of the time, especially the people we're going to pick to compare ourselves to will be the people that we already, in our mind, think we're better than them anyway. So I'm doing pretty good. But see, when I stand before the Lord, he's not going to compare me to you. He's going to compare me to Jesus. My standard is way above you. Your standard's way above me. He's going to compare us to his word, his will, his way. Were we obedient to the spirit? Were we walking in the spirit? And when the spirit prompted you, did you obey? I think back to the scripture where Paul said, we had determined our hearts, we were going to go to this city. And the spirit of God said, no. He stopped us. Don't go. And they obeyed. They did what the spirit of the Lord had said. They obeyed. It's walking in the Spirit. Letting Him, understanding that God, as Brother Lance was saying a moment ago, God's ways are not our ways. The Lord said that Himself. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So why would we depend upon our finite wisdom when we have an infinite God, an eternal God, living on the inside of us, who has said, I will direct your steps. I will tell you what to do. It really should be as simple as this. We should have a stress-free life in that, stress-free spiritual life in that I, I am dead to self. And the only movement I make is the movement the Holy Spirit says, okay, go here. Yes, sir, I'm going. Go over here. Yes, sir, I'm going. Do this. Yes, sir, I'm doing it. Do it right now. Walking. In the spirit. Two things that if you were in the eight o'clock service, you heard portions of this. If you were not, then this would be brand new for you. Two things about the walk. Number one, we are compelled to walk. He said walk in the spirit. The word walk in the Greek text indicates a continuous, regular action. This is a habitual lifestyle. Continue walking, not just walk for a day, but continue walking. And tomorrow you keep on walking. A year from now, you're still walking in the Spirit. It is a blessing in my life to look at, say, my, even my own parents, my father. When I was a child, I learned by watching his example of trusting God, walking in the Spirit, being prompted by the Spirit. I've seen him stand up at the pulpit and say, folks, I had this message planned, but man, the Spirit of God just spoke to my heart, and I have got to change the entire direction of which I'm headed. That spoke to my heart. And then to watch God put his hand upon him and bless him and use him in speaking the truth, being obedient to the Holy Spirit. And, and now... I'm 39 years old and I can look back throughout my whole life and see how my father and my parents have walked with God. They continue to walk with God. Oh, they made mistakes. They didn't do everything right, but they continue. Today, they're still walking in the spirit, walking with God, seeking after God, trying to be led by God. If there's anything I ever learned and desired to be like my father, it was watching him walk in the spirit. And when he believed God said something, he did it. And he would say to me all the time, son, God orders your starts and he orders your stops. And you need to be paying attention just as much to the stops as the starts. 
and listening for the prompting. A continual action. Walk in the Spirit. One of the lessons that was hard to teach my boys, and I did this as a child, is that if, if I said no today, it's no tomorrow. I, I, growing up, we, my brothers and I would do this. We'd ask our parents one day, can we do this? No. Tomorrow we'd go and do it. And I got caught. And my dads would say, son, didn't I tell you? Well, dad, that was yesterday. <laughs> I found out real fast that if he said it yesterday, it included today, tomorrow, and the rest of my life until he changed what he had said. Keep walking. That was a lesson I had to teach our sons, uh, that it's consistency. Discipline is all about doing it today and tomorrow and next week, even when you don't feel like it. Continue walking. And that's what this, the idea, this verb structure, walking in the Spirit means today, tomorrow, next week, next year. Walking in the Spirit. It's a habitual lifestyle. It's a way of life. Being led by the Spirit of God. Being prompted by the Spirit of God. Being touched and pricked and moved by the Spirit of God. And that everything we do is out of an overflow of obedience to the Spirit of God working in our lives. We've studied on Sunday nights uh, for several weeks first in the book of 1 John. And we looked at that scripture in 1 John 3, 9 where it says, He who is born of God does not sin. And we saw the same verb structure as in, in the walk in the Spirit. And that is a habitual lifestyle. That uh, proof of salvation is that I cannot live a lifestyle of sin and God not deal with me. I can't get away with that. The Spirit of God will prick me and convict me and draw me to repentance. And the positive side of that concept of that idea is that walk in the Spirit continually, a lifestyle. It also implies progress. Gives the idea that I am making forward motion. Uh, a statement that I've made to you since I've been your pastor has been moment by moment, day by day, step by step. Moving forward, God is continually, and that's what this walk in the Spirit is. It's forward progress. We're moving just little by little. He's teaching us. He's growing us, making us more like Jesus. And the example, as I gave to you this morning, would be that of just a little baby who has to grow. They have to grow and to learn. You can't expect a newborn to act like a 10-year-old. Now, you can talk to it like a 10-year-old if you want to. You can give it all the instructions that you would give a 10-year-old and tell it, hey, go clean up your crib. You can't leave a crib like that. Go clean that up. And it's just going to look at you and whine and cry and have no idea. It's kind of like the Charlie Brown. All you hear is, Charlie, want, 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 want. Because <laughs> the baby has no idea. It's a baby. It's just growing. And there are times if we're not careful, we'll put so many rules and regulations on a new believer, they feel overwhelmed. I can't do this. When the Bible has not required them to do that. It is the Holy Spirit's job to mold them and make them into the image of Christ. And if there is an issue in their life, then let the Holy Spirit handle it. And now there may be times that the Spirit of God may prompt you to in a, help someone along the way. I mean, that's what the Bible teaches, that the older women teach the younger women, the older men teach the younger men. We help people along the way, but it is out of love. Let me just tell you, just share with you something I learned when I was your age, something God had to teach me, and I've learned along the way. And it's out of love. I want to I help. But it's not out of uh, a legalistic attitude of, let me just beat you over the head with some of these things. I mean, you can't be telling me you're saved and you ain't doing all these things. I look back the first couple of years after I was saved, I didn't see a lot of progress. It was very small, but I was a baby. I was a baby. And I acted like one. I whined when I didn't get my way. Just got over that a little while ago. <laughs> I'm compelled to walk. It's a progress. It's every day a habitual lifestyle. Walk in the Spirit. Number two, we are, it's a command to walk. I'm compelled to walk. I am commanded to walk. That walk in the Spirit in the Greek text uh, is in the imperative mood, which means it's a command. It is not a, hey, let me just give you some, some suge uh, suggestions. This would be helpful uh, ideas, some hints. No, this is a command. Walk in the Spirit. 
He said, this I say then, after all that I've told you, after everything I've explained to you about the law, about the two covenants, about the promise, everything I've explained to you about justification by faith, through, through grace, through, that God's grace has saved us, everything I've told you, now I'm giving you this command, based on all that, walk in the Spirit. This is how you do it. This is how you get past all that other stuff. Walk in the Spirit. Because if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's a command. It's not an option. We, while we understand that it is the Spirit who is the source of the holy living, we trust in Him to live through us. It is the command to the believer to walk. It is a command to the believer to walk. It's the great paradox of the Bible. What seems contradictory where I'm saying that we simply rest and depend upon the Holy Spirit and then now He's telling us to walk. But it's the same concept that I shared earlier that John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And then he said, come to me. I'll satisfy, I'm the bread of life. Come to me. The Bible's full of promises that God answers prayer that uh, where he said in Jeremiah, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you do not know. But he said, call, call. He said, uh, he made a promise, I'll answer you. I'll show you things you've never seen. I will answer your prayer beyond your wildest imagination. I will do things for you that you can't even dream about. But you have to call. Call unto me. Peter says to the Lord, Lord, bid me that I could walk on the water with you. And Jesus said, come on. And Peter could have turned to the disciples and went, isn't that great? The Lord said I could walk on the water with him. Didn't that sound like fun? Y'all want to? No, he had to get up and get out of the boat. At some point, he had to take that first step on the water. And the Lord carried him until he got his eyes off Jesus. But he had to take the step, commanded to walk. The command of Paul to walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh carries the idea that I can walk in the flesh. When it says walk in the spirit, he's commanding us, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That leaves us with the con concept that the opposite is true. You can walk in the flesh and not walk in the spirit. Remember, we've been talking all along about the two natures. You have the old man, the old self, the unredeemable nature, the sin nature that came because we're born of Adam. And when you've been, when you were born again, when you were saved, the spirit of the living God come to dwell inside of you and gave you God's nature. And we'll study next time about the war, that they're at conflict with each other. But the fact that he said, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh carries the idea that you can walk in the flesh. You can operate in the flesh. And I can testify, church, it's not much fun. There's no power. There's no joy. Because I started in the Spirit. I give my life to Christ. Started in the Spirit by faith, trusting in the one who could save me when I couldn't save myself. And now I think I can do it all on my own. I can handle it. I can take care of it. And God took many years to bring me to the end of myself to recognize, God, if you don't work through me, I am just worthless. I've had nothing to offer. And there are times people may think, well, you're just trying to have this false humility. No, I'm telling you the truth. This is a lesson I have learned. I am no good. I am no good whatsoever. The only good that comes out of me is when the Spirit of God works in this old rotten flesh and uses me. It's the only time I make any difference. And even then, it's not me. It's him. Walk in the spirit. We're commanded. We're compelled to, but we're commanded to walk in the spirit. We must walk. It's the command to walk. I said this too. For those of you in the 8 o'clock service, you'd have heard this. I can't remember if I said it in the second service or the 1050 service rather, but I'll say it again. A lesson that I've been taught all my life is God will not do what you must do. I can ask the Lord all day long, Lord, uh, help me to set aside my flesh. No, the Bible says, 
put away the flesh. Set aside yourself. Reckon yourself dead to sin. It didn't say God was going to do that for you. That's a command to us. Walk in the Spirit. Because if you walk in the Spirit, you are setting aside yourself. You are recognizing and realizing that only God's life through you makes any difference. Your old flesh is dead. It's worthless. Walk in the Spirit. The Spirit of God inside of you is your source, your strength, your power. But it is you that must take the step. It is you that must walk. It is you that must obey his leading. There may be times where you're studying God's word, spending time in prayer, or listening to a message, and the Spirit of God pricks your heart and reveals truth to you and said, this is you. You see that scripture you just read? That is you. That's you. He'll prick you. And at that moment, you have a choice to make. See, here's the, there's the problem with truth. is when you see it, you can't unsee it. <laughs> When, you, when God has shown his light upon you, you can't take it back. It, that's why the, the old phrase, ignorance is bliss. Because when God shows you, that's a, it's a danger when you start asking the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Or when you start surrendering yourself and dying to yourself and asking the Spirit of God to be alive and full in you. When you start reading God's word, you start being sensitive to the Spirit. He's going to prick you. And when you see the truth, you're responsible. You're held accountable now. What choice are you going to make? You're going to be obedient to the Spirit? Yes, Lord, you're right. I agree. That's, what, that's the truth about me. I had that very experience Saturday mornings I was studying. I told you I've been reading that book, Spirit Rising by Jim Cimbala, and he had a whole chapter on fellowship with the Father. I was about halfway through, and I read a sentence about spending time alone with God, just fellowshipping with him. And as soon as I read it, the Spirit of God quickened me and said, that's you. That applies to you. That is for you right now. And I had to stop my devotion time and my prayer time and get on my face before God and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I have rushed in and out of your presence just trying to get something from you and not spending time with you. I'm sorry. You have a choice to make. Because see, when you see truth, you can't back out. You can't pretend ignorance any longer. You must make a choice. You'll either obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit and walk in the light that he's given you, or you'll fulfill the lust of your flesh and say, no, I'm going to keep doing what I want to do. What price is too high? What price is too high? What is it that the Holy Spirit of God can say to you and you say, no, 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 that's more than I'll pay. I mean, I want to walk with God and everything, but that's too much. You're asking too much. What price is too high? The Bible says that when the, the rich young ruler came to the Lord Jesus, he, he really came thinking he already had everything under control. He really just wanted Jesus to affirm that you're good. You got it all worked out. But it was just a few seconds that, this, that Jesus put his finger right on this person's problem, this man's problem. And the Bible says he went away sorrowful. He's unwilling to pay the price. He's unwilling to do what God had said for him to do. What is it tonight, church, that if the Holy Spirit said, this is what I want out of you? You want to get closer to God? Then I need you to obey me right here. What is it that if the Holy Spirit put his finger on it, you'd say, no, it's... It's too much. It's too much. I'm not, I'm not going that far. I mean, I believe in all this stuff, and it's good, but I'm not going to be a fanatic now. It's, it's too far. Romans chapter 6, verse 11 says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey in its lust. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm not under the law anymore. I'm under grace. 
Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, you, brethren, have been called to liberty, but do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. So to come full circle from where I started this morning, I am set free. I am not bound by the law to be beat over my, uh, beat my head over with the law saying you have to do this and you have to do that or God won't accept you. I have been set free. I am loved. I'm his son. I have liberty. Paul said, all things are lawful for me. I can do whatever I want to. But not everything's profitable. Not everything's going to benefit me. Not everything's going to help me in my journey with the Lord Jesus Christ. And while I am set free, I cannot take the liberty that God has given me and use it as an occasion to give into my flesh. Matter of fact, I believe it's Romans, if I recall right, it's Romans chapter 13, I believe it's verse 14, where it said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Put on the Lord Jesus, robe yourself, clothe yourself, let every part of your being be the Lord Jesus and make no provision for what you want. Die to yourself. Die to yourself. Reckon yourself dead to sin. I don't have to have what I want. I don't have to have what I desire. What my desire is, is his desire. What he wants, I want. Walk in the spirit. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. Yet not, it's not I that lives, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, the faith of the Son of God. He didn't say faith in the Son of God. He said, I live by faith of the Son of God. I'm living by the faith that he's giving me. I am walking in the Spirit. I'm not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And as I just want to remind you one more time, it says the walk in the Spirit you shall not fulfill. And the better word there is you cannot fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you walk in the Spirit, if your life is under total control, total domination of the Spirit of God, that when he prompts you, you move. When he prompts you to stop, you stop. When he prompts you to speak, you speak. When he prompts you to, to shut up, you be quiet. If I'm doing that, if my life is being operated and controlled by the Spirit of God, I have no time to give provision to the flesh. Because my focus is on walking in the Spirit, being obedient to the Spirit of God. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That word lust is the same word as desire. Last Sunday as we were celebrating uh, the Lord's uh, Easter Sunday. And I read you that scripture in, in Luke where the, Jesus said, I fervently desire to have this communion with you, this, this supper with you, this Passover meal with you. That word desire, he's, it's a deep longing. Jesus is saying, I've been waiting and longing, anticipating having this meal with you. It's the same word used in Galatians chapter 5. That you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, or the desires, the craving, the yearning of the flesh. Because my desire has been transformed. I have died to myself. And my cravings, my yearnings have been transformed to wanting what God wants. To walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit is to be willing to go where the Spirit guides. To do what the Spirit leads. Matter of fact, in verse 18, he said, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. He said, walk in the Spirit. We're being led by the Spirit. Not in the law. Not being beat down with rules and regulations. For I have the Spirit of God, the controller of God in me, molding me and making me like Jesus. To walk in the Spirit is be willing to do whatever he says. It's a habitual lifestyle that desires more than anything else to please the Lord, to be obedient to Him, to His promptings. Are you walking the liberty and the freedom of the Spirit? We reckon ourselves dead to sin and self, to our earthly desires, our fleshly desires. Have you found it easier to measure your spirituality by the list of rules and regulations that you follow instead of by the relationship that you nurture? 
walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let's stand together. It'll take just a moment to spend before the Lord. The altars are open. Maybe we just want to spend some time in prayer tonight saying, Lord, I'm making my choice tonight. I'm going to walk in the Spirit. I'm going to set aside my own desires. I'm going to reckon myself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Maybe you need to say to him tonight, Lord, I've spent my time feeling good about myself because I've been following this list of rules. But I want to be led by the Spirit. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. And I pray that, Father, you speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray that the Spirit of God has illuminated our hearts and minds tonight. And I pray that we'd be obedient to what you'd say to us. And I pray that, Lord, you work it into our hearts and our minds to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of our flesh. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to sing just a hymn of invitation. If the Spirit of God has spoken to you tonight, maybe you just want to spend some time at the altar being still, knowing that He is God. Whatever God may have said to you, I ask you to be obedient as we sing.